It's a pleasure to be here and to join all of you in uh, learning more about Stanford. One of the real attractions for me was being able to attack some of these technology problems from this broader perspective that includes business and policy, uh, economics. And, and so what I'm going to talk to you today about are some significant opportunities that we see in the area of wind energy, uh, but also important hurdles that still remain. And I think that each of you here can help us to overcome them, not just again in the technology, but in many of the, uh, these other facets as well. So when I describe next generation wind energy today, I'm going to define it as technologies that can reach the wind anywhere on Earth. And if you look at a map of the wind around the world, you'll see that this is actually a pretty tall order. So here is a, uh, a map of global winds. Those colors from red to yellow to green are areas around the world where the energy is sufficient to, uh, to, to generate meaningful electricity. And so you'll see here that with just a few exceptions of heavily forested areas, the Amazon, the Congo and Central Af in Africa, and then in a few parts of Southeast Asia, with those exceptions, the wind is broadly distributed and broadly available. Uh, you can compare this, for example, to the distribution of coal deposits around the world. They sit under less than 5% of the Earth's land area, uh, fortuitously for a few countries like the United States, uh, China, and Russia. But again, compared to the wind, the availability is just not there for most of uh, the world's people. And so this provides our first opportunity that we see. You, you heard this number earlier from Arun in an earlier talk, 1.4 to 1.5 billion people without access to electricity at all, many of those people living in areas with significant wind resources. Now, the other opportunity, and one that I'll, I'll focus on in terms of the technology, are literally trillions of watts of power that are inaccessible by current technology. So again, when I say next generation, I'm going to talk about technologies that can potentially harness that currently inaccessible wind power. Now, the origin of that inaccessibility comes from what I'll call resource patchiness. And that patchiness you can kind of get a sense of just by looking at this chart here. The colors themselves have this sort of patchy characteristic to them. If I zoom in on a spot in Southern California where we spent working for the past uh, 10 years or so, you'll see one example in which that patchiness is created naturally. So this is an area in northern Los Angeles County where we've done a lot of our field research that I'll show you guys in a, a bit here. This is about 660,000 acres in class three plus wind sites. So these are wind sites where you could generate commercial projects based on the amount of energy available. And despite this large swath of area in which there are healthy winds, the only places where projects can be developed are in this upper corner here. So naturally, this bullseye here, this very high wind area would be one target. You'd like to get more projects in there, but you can't for technical reasons that I'll talk about later. But there are these other areas as well within this map that have significant wind resources that current technology simply can't access due to the terrain in those areas. And so again, this is a problem that exists both uh, in the United States but all over the world. The other type of patchiness actually comes from the wind turbines themselves. So the current technology that you're used to seeing, the large three-bladed turbines that spin like a propeller, they generate these turbulent wakes that you can see very nicely here. This is in the North Sea at the Horns Rev Wind Farm. So the wind is coming from the bottom left here. And you can see this first line of wind turbines here as they're generating energy. On this day, the fog actually visualizes the choppy air that they create very nicely. And of course, all of these other turbines now are operating in this choppier air. This turns out to be a big technological challenge because that turbulence reduces the energy you can generate from the site. The fatigue that occurs because these blades are being buffeted by the wind reduces the lifetime of the blades as well. And so this is a big technological challenge. Today, the best uh, solution that is out there is simply to put these turbines as far apart as economically feasible. But then what that leads to is these alleys in this case, for example, where we simply don't generate any energy. And so that leads us to losing, for example, here in California, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, a significant chunk of the potential wind energy simply because we can't extract on the entire farm area. So over the past 10 years or so, we've been trying a different approach. Certainly, I would say the mainstream uh, of thought in terms of next generation wind energy, or at least the, the near term, is making larger wind turbines, trying to access energy at higher altitudes. The wind does blow high, uh, more strongly at higher altitudes, and so there's an opportunity there. But we see a larger opportunity 
in a paradigm shift from single monolithic wind turbines that rotate on a horizontal axis, so these are the horizontal axis wind turbines you're used to seeing, to arrays of smaller vertical axis wind turbines that have a variety of features that are potentially transformative, and I'll describe those in a moment. What we've seen over the past few years, and I'll go into more detail in a moment on this, is that, for example, the smaller size of these leads to lower materials costs, lower wind farm signatures. So the visual impact, the acoustics, that sometimes is a challenge for the military, things like radar interference is a concern when these turbines get large. We're able to avoid those using these smaller arrays. The logistics of installation, operations, and maintenance, and O&M, of course, is the major cost after the initial installation of a wind farm, can be potentially uh, a lot lower because, again, these things are sitting much closer to the ground. You don't need specialized equipment to access them. The scalability is something that we're, we're continuing to look at. And one of the exciting things potentially here is that you can go from small distributed outfits where you're only generating 10 kilowatts for a ranch to megawatts for municipalities. And you're not scaling by trying to build larger machines where you need new technology to achieve that larger uh, production. You're simply adding additional of these units to the array. And then lastly, and something that becomes important, especially in the West in terms of permitting, uh, these turbines, these smaller vertical axis wind turbines are safer in terms of burden bat impacts. Now, I want to be clear, the practical fact is that the impact of current technology in the horizontal in, uh, axis wind turbines and birds and bats is minuscule. So more birds will die from power lines, running into buildings, cats, literally, than are killed by vertical axis or by horizontal axis wind turbines. Nonetheless, the reality is that if you want to do a project in California, you're going to have to show mitigation. And so this is one opportunity to do that. Now, what we had done uh, during our time at Caltech was to think about what we call biology-inspired engineering. And that is taking physical principles that we see in natural systems and applying them to improve uh, engineered technologies. So in my lab, we're interested in fluid mechanics, hydrodynamics, and you can see here, for example, one of the systems we study are schooling fish. And so you can see this group of fish here swimming together. And if you watch them, you'll notice they're in a pretty regular pattern here as they swim together with a regular geometric spacing. Now, they face a challenge similar to those wind turbines. Each of them is swimming. They're flapping their tails. They're creating turbulent wakes. And if you're not one of them, you get washed away there. Uh. So, so they're flapping their tails, they're creating these wakes, and yet what they've figured out and what's been measured is that the animals that swim in this school can swim more efficiently in that group than they can by themselves by taking advantage of the interactions with the flow that their neighbors are creating. And so we took this idea and we decided to use it to inspire the design of these large-scale arrays of vertical axis wind turbines. And so the next clip here you'll see uh, our field site. This was in Southern California a few years ago. So for this particular configuration, there's me, so you can kind of figure out how tall these things are. We have them in these counter-rotating uh, configurations, and we have these black stumps you can see in the ground so we could study different array arrangements. And so we were able to take the same math that we used to optimize the array of, of schooling fish to, instead of reducing the drag, which is what the fish are doing as they're swimming through, we're maximizing the amount of energy that we can collect out of this wind farm array. And so, of course, it's an interesting academic uh, question, uh, and the question is, does it actually work? So we measured for going on four years now what we call uh, footprint power density as our major figure of merit. So if I'm standing on a wind farm on a given square meter patch of ground, how much power am I generating, averaged over the entire farm? And so here what I'm plotting is that footprint power density, watts per square meter here, as a function of wind speed from 4 to 14 meters per second. This dashed region here is the performance of modern wind farms in, in terms of that uh, metric. And again, it's determined by how much energy those big turbines can individually sweep, but also the spacing that's required to avoid those turbulent interactions that I showed you before. And so here's the data from the field measurements. Each of these data points is a 10-minute average. At this point, we've taken about 18,000 hours of data at the field site. So the effect is real, and it's significant in that we can improve the footprint power density of these systems by having these turbines interacting. So rather than keeping them as far apart as possible, in some cases, we actually want to put them very close together so that they have these constructive interactions aerodynamically with one another. So this opens up potentially an array of interesting technology applications. 
One of the most uh, exciting for us has been a project in a small Alaskan village in Igiagig. In these areas, one of the challenges they have is that because they're so remote, because they're distant from the grid, they have limited options for their uh, electricity generation. So typically, they're actually flying in diesel fuel to power their villages, and they're paying up to 90 cents a kilowatt hour for their power compared to the 10 cent retail prices you'd see in the lower 48 or even lower in many cases. And so we're working with the uh, Gordon uh, and Betty Moore Foundation, the Alaska Energy Authority, and NSF to think about not only the technology, so here are a couple of turbines that are up at the site that we're currently testing, but also opportunities for community involvement, for a, mo a more holistic approach where these communities own and operate these uh, turbine systems, and we're able to use it as a, uh, an example platform for training students in their schools as well. Uh, in the lower 48, we're interested in, we've been working with the Office of Naval Research, uh, especially uh, the Marines and other groups who have helicopter operations, so we've been working with SPAWAR in particular, on trying to green their energy uh, profile. And so combat en energy security, of course, is a primary operational cost. If I'm at a forward deployed base, for example, I have to take care of that fuel convoy that's delivering energy. There are many opportunities where you could generate your energy in situ, right at the location where you, you're operating. Uh, even for our permanent bases here in the United States, 29 Palms, other places here in California, there's opportunities to generate energy from the wind, but again, you, you can't interfere with helicopter operations. You can't have a radar signature that compromises your other activities, and these low-profile wind turbines are one potential solution that we're developing there. And then thirdly, here in California, we've been working uh, with the uh, California Energy Commission and others to think about repowering. Now, we talk about the Plains states, uh, the Dakotas, Texas, is having a lot of energy. Here in California has some of the best wind energy resources anywhere in the world. The challenge is that a lot of those were first uh, developed in the 80s with these older era wind turbines. And so again, there's a lot of locations where it's not economically feasible to pull these up and put the new ones in place. But with this shorter, smarter, uh, uh, smaller technology, you could put them interstitially in between the existing turbines and generate energy potentially at a lower uh, incremental cost. So this is just a quick uh, survey of some of the opportunities that we see available by taking this different approach to wind energy. And so the question that you ought to ask is, okay, well, why hasn't it happened yet? And there's a lot of uh, important challenges that still need to be resolved. And I'm putting up this picture again uh, because it illustrates an ever-present problem, whether you're talking about vertical axis wind turbines or horizontal axis turbines. And that is that you have to be able to predict the performance of the system. If I want to know what the revenue that I'm going to get out of a particular wind farm is, I need to know how much energy it's generating for wind blowing in a certain direction. The challenge that we see, for example, in conventional wind farms is that the performance can be highly sensitive to wind direction. So a study on this farm, for example, showed that a 10 degree shift in the wind, in the direction of the wind, can change the output by up to 45%, 43%. And so in that environment, we need to be able to develop tools that can allow us to predict the performance computationally in ways that are more effective than what we have now. And this is a difficult problem. It's a really uh, front-end science problem because it requires knowledge of the physics over six orders of magnitude in length and time. So you're talking about trying to understand the airflow over the individual blades, that boundary layer being a few millimeters thick, all the way up to the dimensions of the atmospheric surface layer, which can be hundreds of kilometers, even a kilometer. The time scales, again, a few milliseconds for that wind to pass over the blade. Uh, seasonal changes will occur in, in terms of the wind as well. So this is a huge computational effort one of the draws for me for coming to Stanford is groups like the Center for Turbulence Research that is developing tools for this sort of uh, uh, large-scale computational effort. The other aspect, and this is something that I've lived and suffered for the past five years, is that a lot of new wind turbine concepts, I say underperform, that's maybe uh, an understatement for the system here. These new concepts uh, uh, simply haven't been tested enough. And so this is a commercially available system. And what we've done over the past five years is gotten lots of inquiries from people who say, hey, I have a great idea for a new wind turbine. We say, hey, come out to our site. We'll test it out. And this has been the, the challenge that a lot of these new concepts typically involve complex physics that need modeling assumptions. And so just because you can get the system to work in a wind tunnel, just because you can get it to work in a simplified computer model doesn't mean it works in the field. At the same time, that transition from these scaled models, whether they're in a wind tunnel or in a computer uh, model, uh, 
that transition to the fields is expensive. And so uh, one of the things we're doing here at Stanford is developing a new resource. This is going to be out in the Altamont Pass, uh, a field laboratory, as we call it, for optimized uh, wind energy. You always need a good acronym, so FLOW is our acronym here. So this, there you saw off on the side is one of the existing wind turbines there. And we're going to be studying arrays of these smaller vertical axis turbines. You can get the scale from the woman here in the front. The arrays here are colored as uh, red and blue just to indicate that we can have different signs of rotation. So if you're looking at it from a bird's eye view, some of these are, will, will rotate clockwise and others will rotate counterclockwise. That's an outcome that we found from our studies of the fish schooling, that that rotational sense can make a big difference in terms of the amount of power you can get out of the system or even guiding the wind in certain directions as you go through the farm. Uh, we have a site here that I'll, I'll discuss in more depth. Uh, later, where we also have solar and battery systems as well. So we'll look at uh, microgrid type science there and then a MET tower as well. So we're interested in optimization of wind turbine array concepts. These are images from our site in Southern California where we started a lot of this research, uh, evaluating new wind turbine concepts. Uh, as you heard earlier in Arun's talk and other, others as well, there's an, an important push toward decentralization for energy security reasons, for economic reasons, for development in the developing world reasons. And a lot of those concepts, again, need real world testing. And so this site's going to be unique in allowing us to do real world testing at the full scale that you would see in some of these systems for, for example, combinations of wind, solar, diesel and battery uh, microgrids. And then all importantly for computational models, for again predicting how much power you're going to generate, we'll be producing validation data for computational models there as well. So ultimately what we want to develop here is through these technologies an ability to attack the big problems, global energy poverty, this wind resource patchiness, uh, of course, I hope you understand that this, this graphic here is misleading because it's not just a technological problem. And again, one of the reasons why I wanted to have the chance to talk to you guys today is to bring up the fact that there are other issues that are involved here that simply haven't been investigated. We know, for example, that in these small vertical axis wind turbines, there's possibilities to improve the uh, economics through mass production. These turbines here only have about two dozen parts, whereas a conventional large-scale turbine has 8,000. So instead of making you know, 8, 000, uh, a widget with 8,000 parts a small number of times, you're making a large number uh, of replicates of a smaller number of components. How that actually plays into the bottom line for a business model is something that I think would be interesting to, to look at more carefully. Because right now, the companies who are doing this in terms of startup are thinking about selling two or three or four at a time. They're not thinking about selling 2,000 or 20,000, as would be the paradigm if you're thinking about doing this at large scale. In terms of regulation, one of the real opportunities here is that uh, if you think back to that map of the, the wind speed, actually I have it right here, that patchiness. So if I zoom in on that, there are lots of locations in the US that we could potentially extract wind energy from where because it's too close to a community, they, they've banned the large scale wind turbines. And sometimes they do this through blanket uh, ordinances against any structure, say over 60 feet tall. Well, if I have a technology that can generate sufficient energy at 35 or 40 or 50 feet, then potentially I can have a work around those ordinances, but how do you do that in a way that doesn't get the ordinance changed to 30 feet, right? So there's important community engagement, a cultural acceptance of these types of technologies as well is something that is a, a part of this problem. So uh, with that, let me just uh, mention very uh, significant student involvement in all of this work. We have a growing consortium of, of schools who've been interested in this, and I think it's because of the multidisciplinary uh, nature of this work that there's been interest, whether it's from the basic science side, the computational sciences, material sciences, thinking about the grid, policy, business. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we see in this area, and so hopefully we can uh, encourage some of you to take part. Uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Let me just give you my contact. Here's where you can find me. There's the Stanford S. Uh, we have to have that, apparently. It's in my contract. Uh, so I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the question was the effects of temperature, maybe I can say more broadly climate, in terms of uh, implementing these in tropical areas versus in a place like Alaska. Is, is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the, the big challenges you have with all of these wind turbine systems, as opposed to, uh, you know, think of solar panels, is moving parts. 
And so, for example, there's uh, certain applications we're working in Hawaii on another project, for example, where you have to worry about sea spray, for example, and the corrosion that might be caused by having a system out in that area. In Alaska, icing is a, is a big challenge that we have to think about in, in uh, the context of the, the operations in Igiagi. So in each case, there's typically going to be a different solution. So for example, in the case of our Alaska project, what we've been doing is looking at strip heaters along the length to avoid some of the icing effects that you would typically see. So that uh, uh, basically avoids ice accretion on the blades. At the same time, I will note that because these blades rotate at much slower speeds than the large ones, the big concern in icing typically is that these chunks of ice could be tossed and that becomes a, a safety hazard. Because these blades are rotating more slowly, that that uh, issue is mitigated already. The reason we're still interested in reducing the ice accretion is then just for the aerodynamic performance because when the ice grow, accretes on the, the blades, it changes the aerodynamic profile. Uh, in the case of marine environments, tropical environments, there it's again a materials question. You want to come up with materials that are going to be robust to temperature swings or, or certain uh, uh, atmospheric conditions, UV exposure, for example. The benefit that I see for this type of technology is that the solution doesn't need to be one size fits all. So you could have a certain blade type that would be ideally suited for Alaska. A different blade type might be ideally suited for a tropical climate or something else. Thank you. Yes, in the back. So the uh, first question in, in terms of current systems, the a wind turbine, let's say two megawatt turbine you want to buy today, typically the turbine itself is going to be anywhere between a dollar ten and a dollar ninety a watt. So for a megawatt turbine, a million one to a million nine. For the turbine, the installed cost when you put in balance of systems, anywhere from one and a half dollars to two, maybe even three dollars a watt installed. These systems today, if I buy one of these off the shelf, is probably a factor of two and a half or three above that right now. But a lot of that goes to labor. So if I go back to an earlier slide, if I can see if it'll take me back. Uh, actually, I think I cropped it out here. So you can't really see, but these turbines are shipped to you in a crate, and then they send two nice gentlemen out with wrenches, and they put the thing together. So there's a lot of costs involved in that just in terms of labor. What we imagine in a larger scale system is where this, these systems are mass produced. There's no reason, for example, that this uh, rotor system here couldn't be produced in a single location and sent to you ready to set up and go. So until those costs are built out of it, I think they're going to continue to be more expensive. And the places that are low hanging fruit for competition is where you're paying 90 cents a kilowatt hour. Because we can, for example, in Alaska do a project up there, and maybe the cost is 30 cents a kilowatt hour, but it still beats flying in diesel fuel. But to get to those lower costs where you're competitive with five cents, or you know, Arun talked about getting down to four and a half cents to, or, or more, you're going to have to think about a new manufacturing modality versus the, the, the current uh, state of the art. Thank you. Hi, John. Here. Uh, oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Santiago from Business School. Congrats on your first class. It was very cool. Uh, w w one question also sticking to the economics of the projects. Uh, with these optimizations, we've, we've spoken a lot about wind energy through, uh, throughout the conference and it's been extremely interesting. With these optimizations, do you have any sense on how the return on this project varies? Yes, yeah, so you mean with wind direction, for example? Or yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a, that, that's a I have a much longer slideshow I can I can give you later on. So that's one of the important things that we've been looking at is what's the optimal arrangement of the turbines for the wind conditions at a given site. And so what you would typically see, for example, is at our Southern California site, the wind varies very little, maybe plus or minus 10 degrees uh, from a prevailing wind direction year round. And so there you can have an optimized system that can get a benefit of in terms of power output. Uh, you know, 6x or, or, or 10x in terms of that uh, power density, 30% uh, in terms of efficiency. If, on the other hand, I have a, a, a location where it varies over 90 degrees, let's say, it shifts the wind direction shifts seasonally, I'll have a different optimal configuration that would take advantage of all those wind directions. The average benefit would be lower than what you'd see for the other case, but it would uh, still be uh, much better than the current paradigm of spreading them out far apart. So the real challenge in both of those is that we want to be able to have a way to model and predict what would be the optimal arrangement for a given wind direction shift uh, without having to go out to the field and do these experiments. Because these are really expensive experiments to do. They're, they're essential now, but you want to get to the place where you can do it in silico. 
So uh, the success of a talk is measured by how many questions there still are when we have to say that was the uh, last question. So okay. I'm sorry about that, but I got the note from the back. Okay, that, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll be around and yeah. Yeah, uh, so great, info. you'll be around. Uh, please join me again. I think uh, the previous questioner was right on. Excellent first talk. Uh, <laughs> off to a great start. And our, our gain is Caltech's loss. Great to have you here. <laughs> thank you.